Hi, I'm Theo. And these broadcasts are to support the blogs on nomorshe.com's website as well as the online classes. In this episode, we want to get the background on women in antiquity focusing on Aristotle. Welcome back to the No More She broadcast. In today's broadcast, we want to look at the background of women from antiquity focusing on Aristotle. Recently, I was in a Bible study looking at Luke chapter 8, at the very beginning, and it was interesting, Luke's use of women, and when you contrast that to the way women are perceived in antiquity, it is rather uh, stark, and so it just jumps off the page to me, and so some wanted me to dig further into this, and so we can go back to the likes of Aristotle, realizing that Aristotelian uh, philosophy and writings were not sure of its uh, exact uh, influence upon the first century biblical writers because there seems to be a gap in the time that we uh, experience Aristotle as if his writings kind of disappeared for a few centuries and then they're rediscovered uh, by some Islamic scholars later on and so we're not sure how much of his philosophy does influence. However, it is rather apparent that his household codes are very much in purview during the New Testament uh, writers, uh, according to many scholars. And that is very applicable to what we're going to discuss today. Taking these translations from uh, Alan in her book on the concept of women, Aristotle, in uh, one of his works, uh, describes a boy actually resembles a woman in physique. A woman is, as it were, an infertile male. The female, in fact, is a female on count of an inability of sort. It lacks the power to concoct semen out of the final state of nourishment, that is, either blood or its counterpart in weatherless animals, because of the coldness of its nature. Now, again, this is ancient Greek philosophy by Aristotle, and the idea is that uh, for Aristotle and then for the Greeks, uh, and coming into Greco-Roman understanding then is this idea that women actually, and this is scientifically proven today, that women are not, do not have the power within them to produce whether a, a child is going to be a male or female in gender. That is based on the chromosome that is delivered to the woman from the man in his semen. So there's there's a little bit of agreement there with modern science and modern biological understanding that it is the male who decides what the gender of the baby inside the female's womb is going to end up being. That is true, but there's more here going on inside the womb uh, in Aristotle, as we're going to see and and as we continue uh, further in this same work. So the male and the female are distinguished by a certain ability and inability. Male is that which is able to concoct and to cause to take shape and to discharge semen possessing the principle or the form. Going on, female is that which receives a semen but is unable to cause semen to take shape or discharge it or to form. And so, again, you have this quite interesting distinction inside the womb. Uh, he goes on, just as it sometimes happens that deformed offspring are produced by deformed parents, and sometimes not. So the offspring produced by a female are sometimes female, sometimes not, but male. The reason is that the female is, as it were, a deformed male. And the menstrual discharge is semen, though in an impure condition. That is, it lacks one constituent and only one, the principle of the soul. Now, do you understand what Aristotle is laying down here? That in the womb, when a, an embryo is forming, if it turns out and ends up 
being female, then it did not fully evolve. It's deformed. There's discussion among scholars, and they're trying to sort this out, whether Aristotle believed that by nature's design, all babies should be male, and that those that are female are deformed, and that was not nature's intent. And they're, they're trying to unravel that mystery to understand what Aristotle was trying to say fully. But in the very minimum, you can see that inside the womb, whenever a baby that is born is a female, it did not reach its full maturity. It is deformed. It did not become male as intended. That's what he's trying to say. And that's the understanding that that a woman is a deformed male. So it's it's as if the child did not fully develop as it was, per se. And he's basing this on his observations of nature. And when you see babies born that are defective, that are, you know, something wrong with the child when they're born, and trying to discern from the parentage, you know, what happens, birth defects. Is it from the parents, or how has it come? And in the end, he decides that females are a birth defect. They're deformity. They are, as other authors have translated this Greek term, deficient. Males are fully sufficient. And all females are deficient. They are deformed because they did not fully develop into what was intended. Interestingly. Going on, while still within the mother, the female takes longer to develop than the male does. I don't understand this exactly as far as the science is concerned, but of the day, this is what it was thought in Aristotelian philosophy, which is the science of the day. Though once birth has taken place, everything reaches its perfection sooner in females than in males. That is, puberty, maturity, old age, because females are weaker and colder, and we should look upon the female state as being, as it were, a deformity, though one in which occurs in the ordinary course of nature. So again, they're not sure, as they go back and forth and discuss this, if Aristotle actually believed that nature's design was that all would be male. Interestingly here, but you can clearly see he's got this concept of the male being more hot, the female being colder, and by nature of that, then, you know, females somehow take longer, so that, you know, to, to produce. But then in the end, when they, when they exit the womb, they are very fastly quicker to enter into puberty and adulthood. Now, again, going to uh, Smith and uh, Ross here, in, in their understanding, and they're trying to dive into another passage, uh, they note here that, but if the semen cannot impress its male character upon the embryo, it forms the embryo defectively. Again, it's this deformity into a female, and hence the female character may said to exist potentially in the semen. So all semen can have females. And if there is a deformity or defect, then the woman produces a female child, a baby girl. This is the underlying philosophy that is inherent in the science of the day. This is the science of the day. Greco-Roman philosophy is the science of the Greco-Roman world. And so, it, again, women are seen as deficient. Okay? So, that's why they cover their hair, and that's why men have shorter hair, because they... Uh, this whole discussion that you can find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is discussed. And this understanding in the Greco-Roman world that women received the semen and held on to it. And that's by nature of their lengthy hair is to receive it. And male is able to give out the life. 
and life exudes from the male and the woman has to receive it. Thus, the longer hair is, is an indication of that receptivity of the life, of the semen. So it's, it's kind of along the lines today we understand science in the fact that a child sex gender is going to be based upon what the male gives the female. That's true. But to go so far as to call a girl child a female baby deformity or defective, that's the language that's being used here. Now, again, uh, Alan is going to go so far as to summarize her understanding of what Aristotle is saying. In every respect, the deformity of woman pervaded her identity and her nature. That's how she understands much of what Aristotle is doing. And I just wanted to summarize this here in this video for you and I, for us to understand what it meant to be female, what it meant to be a woman in the Greco-Roman science that underlies the biblical period of time when these texts are being formed. This is the understanding. Now, going on, earlier we go back to Plato. And I remember now Plato, Platonic, Neoplatonism, all of that is going to come into bear in the first century. And the first century New Testament texts are looking backwards, obviously, to what was said previously. So they're looking back to the Hebrew Bible and they're looking back. And this is rather astonishing how one understood. So this is Plato's symposium where he is describing what Socrates understood the relationship between male and female, and ultimately the relationship between men and women. Now, men, according, this is the translation from the Loeb Classical Library, men who are sections of the male pursue masculine, and so long as their boyhood lasts, they show themselves to be slices of the male by making friends with men. Okay, so you need to understand that what we have is in this thinking, there are three basic species of human. There are men who are men. There are women who are women. And then there's kind of this mix. There are men and women who are in transition. They don't quite get to either place. So they're kind of in transition. Okay, so... And a man who truly wants to be a man is the manly man, the true man, who is the double male, okay? That men who are sections of the male, 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 pursue the masculine. Again, they're after that male component. And so long as their boyhood lasts, their boyhood is a transitional stage. They show themselves to be slices of the male by making friends with men and delighting to lie with them, and to be clasped in men's embraces. These are the finest boys and striplings. Again, this is uh, describing uh, pederasty. This is describing where men embraced the masculine, and this is where true love is going to come. So to try to, to encapsulate what's going on here is boys, in order to become the male-male, the double male, they need to embrace their masculinity by becoming intimate with men. And that's how they're describing this, that a boy is going to be drawn to the man. At the same time, for the man to uh, enjoy true intimacy, he would not find himself in the company of anything else other than something that is uh, masculine. But... Since men are superior, then you can have men on men. So you have men with those who are inferior, and you have this idea of the strong and the weak, the superior and the inferior, and the master and the submissive slave, and you have this dynamic where both are reciprocating in this relationship, and out of it, 
they deem this as some kind of true erotic love. And this is what is being presented as the basis for their thought system. Okay. For they have the most manly nature. So again, if a man is going to seek an inferior vessel to, to experience the greatest love, they don't go to a woman. They go to another male, but a male who is in transition. Okay, this is rather disturbing for our, probably our understanding, but this is the way they understood it. Some say they are shameless creatures, but falsely. They don't say this is shameful. Interestingly, we would find this the opposite, hopefully. For their behavior is due to not to shamelessness, but to daring manliness and virility, since they are quick to welcome, welcome their like. So this is being argued in the symposium by Socrates that it's preferable. This is Plato uh, teaching what Socrates taught, uh, understanding that this is their, to choose their like kind. And they're like kind. The better, the better likeness, the better pursuit of love in the erotic sense would be with one who is closer, not further away. And we'll get into that as we go down through these, uh, these, uh, through our presentation. Sure evidences of this is the fact that on reaching maturity, these alone prove in a public career to be men. So, children are still developing, and if they end up being adult males, then obviously that is what they, that's the highest good, the highest form in this sense of being human. And so, you know, that's superior. And so that's what they're developing towards, but they're going to reach to what is closest to them in their likeness which is another man. So when they come to man's estate, they are boy lovers and have no natural interest in wiving. They don't want a wife. Okay. And getting children. But only do these things under stress of custom. In other words, this is necessary. They are quite contented to live together unwedded all of their days. So let's go through this. The idea of pederasty, where an adult male is with a young and it, it's it's kind of the age of marriage in the ancient world where they typically would marry a woman between the age of 12 and 17 well typically they would do this with boys who are typically of that age so the greatest form of love true love and this is a cultural phenomenon remember so true love was between an adult male who's superior and a young male who's submissive and that is the highest form of eroticism and the highest form of love. And the young man was almost, he was almost there. He's not quite there. So he's in transition from a female like state, an inferior state, to a full blown male. And so to, to go toward that, to gravitate toward that, is the greatest expression for eroticism. Women then were typically only useful for producing sons or heirs. That's all they are. They are a factory. You could get a woman, marry her for the sole purpose of producing sons, heirs, and then divorce her and leave her to herself for nothing. She was left alone. Pleasure then, the highest form of pleasure is coming from an adult male's interaction with young males. That's the highest. And this is what they understood in the science, in the philosophy, in the thinking through this idea of pederasty. Women are again relegated to only necessary evil. We need them to produce more men. That's it. This is the context from which the world understood how things worked. And this, this I find this in, in intriguing in the sense that there are modern forms of this that are still around today. A, in my interaction with uh, those who have been a part of the Islamic religion, 
in this part of the world in which I've uh, dealt with, plus those missionaries who have worked in the Middle East, this is very much the same kind of thinking. Remember, it was the Islamic uh, scholars who discovered the Aristotelian text. Now, we're talking about Plato here, but Aristotelian philosophy was rediscovered. The documents were found among Islamic peoples and scholars that we have, you know, and so they gravitate toward this idea of, of the male dominant over the female and that female really is a lesser form of deformity, uh, lesser being nothing. And so in the Islamic religion, you know, you see that the male dominance, the patriarchal in, inside their Sharia law and everything, because this is the thinking behind it. And so I have understood people who practice Islamic faith that this is a higher form of love for them. And again, they would rather find the companionship to uh, experience pleasure in a young man and, and in that union somehow that's some kind of a, a higher form of love than they would a woman. A woman is only, and they can have multiple wives. They have a harem because the woman is only to produce more men, to produce heirs, to produce sons. And if you cannot produce a son, then obviously, yes, we go to someone else who can give me that because you're, you're, you're not only defective or deformed, but you can't even give me sons. And another way I've experienced this is in the Hindu religion, of which in countries that I've worked with, uh, they also uh, tend to have multiple wives, that a husband will marry a woman because he wants an heir, wants a son. And if that wife cannot produce, then he will get a second wife, a third wife. And it's practice, multiple wives in hopes of getting that treat because obviously, you know, humans are bound by their mortality and they don't live forever. So you're looking to pass on to the next generation through the sun and the aspect of a sun here. And so this is, this is prevalent today in two of the major religions that I find myself interacting, interacting with, whether it be, Hinduism or Islam in this part of the world that I'm in, and they both kind of have this same ideology. And this is the world into which the Bible is speaking. Uh, we can find examples of this also uh, in, uh, in other writings, in other Greek writings, such as this one. And this is also found in Plutarch. Uh, but Hermippus in his lives refers to the tale story in which is told by some of Socrates, namely that he used to say that there were three blessings for which he was grateful to fortune. And this is quoting Socrates. First is that I was born a human being and not one of the brutes. Next, that I was born a man and not a woman. And thirdly, a Greek and not a barbarian. So, you know, these are the things they, they focused upon. These are blessings. That it was a bad thing to be a woman. And uh, interestingly, we find this in the rabbinical literature as well, where one of the rabbis says that a person must recite three blessings every day. Praised are you, O Lord, who has not made me a Gentile. Praised are you, O Lord, who did not make me a boar. And praised are you, O Lord, who did not make me a woman. Now, some scholars have understood this and this is also you know found in other places in the rabbinical literature listed here but uh, some scholars have understood this to say i am thankful that god did not make me a woman because to be a woman in this world not that a woman is a bad thing but a woman in this world goes through so much more trials and tribulations that i i'm glad i'm not a woman so i'm thankful that you did not make me a woman because being a woman a woman has to go through so much more. And, and in the rabbinical or the Jewish writings, it's not necessarily thinking less of a woman, but just understanding that a woman has to go through so much more that 
I, I'm thankful that I don't have to do that as a woman, you know, the bearing children and all that pain and all the things of, of, of living life as a woman. Now, I want to go back uh, again to Aristotle from which we started. And you, you find this, there's, there's these tables of opposites, okay, uh, throughout uh, from Pythagoras, Plato, and then here is an example from Aristotle that, that, that uh, Alan has put together uh, from, from his uh, metaphysics, you know, his writings that he went after. Speaking of physics, I'm going to speak, you know, to higher things or different things. And, and you see this kind of uh, philosophical discourse, and you have this idea of these two oppositional things. And I deal with this in my, uh, actually in my dissertation, and I wanted to get to this, and I, I didn't get to spend so much time here, but, uh, you know, I, I deal with this idea of, of these extremes and this, this uh, polarity uh, along this continuum, and you have these opposites. You have the superior, obviously, and the inferior, the finite, the infinite, the odd, the even, the one, and the many, the right, and the left, and the male and the female. The rest and motion, uh, the straight and crooked, the light and darkness, good and evil, and square and oblong. And, and all throughout my channel, I'm dealing with these because Paul deals with these. Okay. And, you know, in Galatians, we have that famous verse in chapter 3 there at the end. I believe it's verse 27, 28. Paul takes uh, a hold of these. But he's he's constantly dealing with these things throughout. And and the biblical writers are constantly dealing with these because it comes out of Second Temple period. Judaism, they're also dealing with this. Of course, Aristotle being from the time that he was. And then that's the Second Temple period. And so they're also dealing with these ideas. But um, I'm dealing with it all the way back as far as in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and a lot of the stuff that I'm doing on, on this channel. And so it's, a, it's an aspect of privation, though, privations, okay, that, you know, and male and female. And the idea of privation and the non-participation, the separation, that the female did not ascend to that height that was intended to be a male, and it's something less. Now, females are higher than slaves in some sense, and Aristotle, I don't want to get into that, but Aristotle's, you know, understanding of slaves, you know. And then he, again, he goes in the animal world to do this, and, and I, I just in touch, I mean, this is, you know, already this video is much longer than I wanted, and I didn't even get to uh, what Luke does in chapter 8, so, um, but Already you can see, and I could go on and on and on, you know, the idea of how the world has perceived women. And I find it odd that along this line, and I could go deeper and deeper into this, this is just introductory. Um, a good, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in this, not only is Alan good, but you could go on further with uh, Bridget Call has her uh, work entitled The Galatians Reimagine and Reading with the Eyes of the Vanquished, um, where she gets into some of this. But, um, you know, you, you just need to understand, okay, all the atheists that criticize the Bible and say how bad it is do not realize the world in which the Bible was written is entirely, you know, something else. And I think David Bentley Hart has rightly addressed much of atheism on this. So you can check out his work uh, where he goes to the history of Christianity and shows that today's atheists are just lazy because they haven't realized the context to which God is speaking and how he has to communicate. And it's often, you know, this is how scholars have dealt with it in the Bible, that God is not blessing a particular culture in the sense that he's blessing the slavery or these other things or, you know, pederasty. He's not blessing them, obviously. He's speaking into them and saying, you know, something else, something different. And so he's on a different scale, a different spectrum, a different continuum. And, and you know, 
They're speaking along these extremes, and God is speaking something entirely that's that's just revelatory beyond this. And so what God does in the Bible and in his revelation, whether it be the Hebrew Bible or whether it be what the Christians further add in the New Testament, you know, um, there's so much more going on. And so, yes, there is some killing in the Bible that's spoken of, and there is slavery in the Bible that's spoken of, and there is things, you know, that 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 they're dealing in a patriarchal society that's not perfect, and yet what they do to go above and beyond what the world is. It kind of reminds me of the book of Job. In the book of Job, his three friends have their arguments. Uh, a fourth argument is given in the sense of this is the best that the Jews have to offer. If you were to argue the way the world argues, you have three great arguments on the problem of evil or the problem of suffering or whatever. And then you have the best Jewish argument of the day by the fourth friend. And then God, you know, totally goes beyond and above that and blast it and goes, you know, let me just, let me just go and just like, you know, jump out of your thought process and go way beyond into something uh, much higher and much more incredible. And the same thing can be said when you're dealing with uh, uh, the factors of gender and this whole, uh, whole mess of the male and female paradigm uh, of what the Bible is speaking into. And then when the Bible, um, you know, I guess very quickly here in Luke chapter 8, when the Bible actually names women by name, and shows that they are uh, sources that are following the Lord and supporting his ministry financially and have been changed and transformed by the Lord to show that these women, you know, find themselves in a place that is far above these extremes of the Greco-Roman thought system. It, it should just blow your mind to think. Uh, and how the Bible describes that a male and female come together and become one when you have something like this of these, the opposites, the binary opposites of Aristotle, and that the highest love is not between a male and a female, but the highest love is between a male and a young man. And that's just, it's, it's utterly ridiculous to think you know, that the Bible is, is evil or wicked when it's speaking in this context. And so our perspective is wrong. We cannot see the world as they saw it to understand what God was trying to speak through the people of that day to that situation and then see out of it what Christianity did in context of that world. Instead, we have the context of our world where we have gone far beyond that. It's almost like the fathers who spoke, you know, the fathers who spoke about the Trinity later on and have that Trinitarian language, and we don't have the word Trinity in our Bible because, again, it's using, in the context, it's using language of its day, and then later on, people can say it in a different way, in a better way, after people have had time to to understand a better framework from which to continue the dialogue. And that's academics that I keep arguing with on this channel. Academically, people go to a higher level. And so when I ran across this, I was initially disturbed and could not fathom. And, and so this is the context that the Bible speaks into. And the Bible has totally turned everything upside down. It's the upside down kingdom, and and that's what Paul, you know, is blamed for. I think in Acts chapter fourteen or whatever, where, you know, the, the pagans are saying, you know, th this this guy has turned our world upside down, and if this is the way you understand as a man, in charge and in power, and this is the way you understand, based on what I've already talked about on this channel, if you're in a position of power, and as a man, and you're at the head, and and you see Paul coming along and elevating the slaves and elevating women, and Peter's done the same thing, and James is doing the same thing when he's 
again, go back to my series on James and, and how we replace the powers. When you're in a position to speak and, and you turn the world upside down and you say, no, women have a voice. And women play a significant part and a role. And slaves have a voice. And they, you know, I speak to them. And they are on equal standing with the other disciples because I named them. You know, the, the, this is unreal to think what's going on here. So, you know, he's calling them out by name, saying that they are in a position of power where they have wealth that they're using. Luke, Paul, Peter, James, they're all describing a world that's exactly what was said of Paul, they, that, that the Christian understanding, the lens by which God has taken, it's a mirror image that we are mirroring heaven here on the earth as it is in heaven. And we flipped it because the mirror image has flipped it. It's an upside down kingdom where those who are lower, the poor and lower caste are elevated. The mountains are brought low and the valleys are brought exalted. The humble become exalted and the exalted become humbled. And you see that upside down kingdom because we're a mere reflection of, of heaven on earth. And we turn this world upside down and make it to be what it truly is meant to be. And that's just amazing. And so I wanted to, to kind of highlight this and show the context from which the Bible is speaking. And that women are equally disciples. They're equally given in verse 9 as disciples. And in verse 10 of Luke chapter 8, they're given uh, the secrets to the kingdom, the knowledge, just the same as men are. And so are slaves, and so are the poor, and so are the tax collectors, and so are all the people that are not in your right you know, system, where you have all these people on the left against all those people on the right and there should be a separation and and the lord brings them together in a sense okay some of these things socially and so some of the social paradigms that we have the injustice as i argue in my embodied justice you know video and paper some of these are just you know totally turned on themselves and jesus turns the tables and turns the world upside down because he's showing you what it truly means to be God, what it truly means to be human. And they ultimately are the same thing when heaven and earth become one, when culturally men and women become one, just as Genesis promised that the two come together and become one. And they have this equality that is missing in a, in a world that thinks like this. So hopefully this video, this background video will help you understand the Greco-Roman context, uh, some of the Jewish ideas that still are, you know, understand that things are still in the medieval period that is grabbing onto the Renaissance that grabbed onto a lot of these Greco-Roman ideas, and it carried on into the Reformation, and, you know, some of the, the ideas that are good, but some of the ideas that are bad, and some of the things that need to be rethought. It's interesting to note that there were some that were in the Catholic Church bringing Reformation-type ideas to the fore, to the front, but they were women, and they weren't heard. But a guy, a man named Martin Luther, says the same thing, and he is able to, because of his being, by virtue being a man and his position, he was heard and the women were not heard. And so that, that, that's just amazing to think about that. And so, again, the medieval world of Martin Luther would listen to him, and he was able to do what he is, but it was done through a lot of violence. And a woman, some women who were speaking the same type thing were ignored and were not heard until later inside the Catholic Church when they had their own Reformation inside the church then they begin to dig and see oh well we had voices that were not listened to that were not heard that were saying these things long before luther 
<laughs> you know, but they weren't heard. They didn't get the voice. They didn't get, they weren't heeded. And so again, you know, it goes back to this, the humble get exalted and the exalted get humbled and some of these voices that aren't listened to, you know. And so it's interesting to note that, you know, that people don't often realize that and they don't focus on women like Catherine of Siena, I believe, and, and uh, whatnot. So some of these voices that were inside the church uh, trying to say the very same thing and, and were, were also silenced by virtue of uh, they were, like Luther, they were rebels against the powers that were wrong, but they're also women. So they were not heard. So interesting. So think about that and think about how the gospel is bringing the good news where, as I keep saying, Douglas Knight, that quote over and over again, where righteousness and justice come and overcome what we have done, you know, and bring, restore things through new creation back to what God originally intended in new creation. And, and again, go back to all the things we're doing on this channel to exemplify that. As we conclude to wrap things up, there's a few caveats we must uh, add here. Uh, scholars like Lynn Kohick have noted that in the first century, uh, Aristotelian philosophy did hold quite a bit of sway, especially among Hellenism, whereas the Platonic views that mentioned in this video don't seem to hold sway. So, for instance, in her book on women in the world of the earliest Christians, uh, she doesn't highlight pederasty or uh, Platonic thought much or this true love. But uh, she highlights how scholarship has gone into the Aristotelian ideas and women function above children and above slaves in a hierarchy, but they are kept separate for sure and in a place of submission when it comes to uh, men and in and, and the Roman world. And so in first century... In the era of the New Testament writers, uh, you know, the, the ideas presented herein of Aristotle uh, hold huge sway. Now, Paul does address some of the pederasty in, in some of the language of, of the writings associated with Paul. So there is some of that going on. But this idea, the Platonic true love that, that we talked about, uh, doesn't seem to be among the common. And uh, people, obviously. Maybe it's something of a higher philosophy among the elite, per se, but it's not a common practice that we see from the data points that we have. But if you think about today, again, my experience with Islam, uh, I'm sure uh, of those in the Islamic religion across the world, this idea that I encountered is probably also not so widely practiced among everyone that women in the Islamic world they do uh, they do have their uh, place and they have it's not you know necessarily the way I described in this video in practice and reality but the the ideology the philosophy the thinking is there and that's what's dangerous. And so some of these Aristotelian ideas do hold uh, a lot of sway. And I would encourage you for further research to reach out to works like uh, Lynn Coix and, and see what's going on in the New Testament period. Similarly, concerning the current paradigm going on in the Roman Catholicism, American Bishop Robert Barron has noted that while it's a tragedy and any single incident is horrific of what has been in the media concerning uh, the situation among priests and boys often. Uh, he noted that when you statistically analyze it, that sadly the church is following the same kind of trend as in the rest of society. And obviously there's room for improvement and the church sadly, as he states, is no different from society as a whole, that, that there, the incidents being reported uh, are in equal to what's uh, already occurring in society and has been hidden and is now being brought out 
for all to understand the situation. And so we're not sure, again, how much this is prevalent in the first century and how much this is prevalent also even in our world today. And so it makes it very tricky. Uh, but I am pretty confident that it is occurring to uh, a degree that we would find alarming across the spectrum, as Bishop Barron has made known. So these are disturbing topics, and they need to be uh, addressed by practical theology in ways that can really help uh, so that we can achieve what Douglas Knight has expressed uh, repeatedly about the restoration of justice and righteousness. Thank you very much, and God bless you for listening. Stay tuned for more episodes and videos to help you with your journey from nomorec.com.